So today I uh, I'm very happy to present the work we've been doing on the validation of the CFD software we're working on and we're developing, and it's uh, we're going to be discussing a very specific validation uh, case, uh, which is uh, the flow over periodic ills. So this work was done by a PhD student of mine, Laura Prieto Salibra, and uh, was actually started by two interns, so Catherine and Audrey. So I'm the guy taking credits for women's work, but actually they did the core of the work. So I want to put the emphasis of that. They did an amazing job. And uh, Audrey was only a third year chemical engineering student when she started to work on this. So uh, she learned a lot and I was quite pleased to see what she could accomplish. So let's go. So. Um, just a brief overview, I'll discuss a bit the platform we're working on developing. I'll present what is the flow over periodic hills, the case, and I'll discuss some of the things we looked at, like influence of time step and influence of mesh density. So you'll see this work is going to be a lot more applied. It's really more on the, let's say, uh, applied computational science uh, side of things and really on the validation. And we actually, at the end, I'll, I'll discuss and along the way also, some of the things we learned, some of the conclusions were very positive, some were not actually, some uh, uh, things I thought at the beginning would prove out or would turn out to be uh, very good, well, they, they did not turn out so, and then we'll see as we go. So uh, what is Lete? So Lete is the solver my group is developing. It uh, allows for high order uh, finite element schemes, so we use mostly continuous Galerkin approaches. It enables multi-physics coupling. In our case, we work mostly on with chemical reactions, heat transfer. Uh, we have a VOF model and incompressible flows. So it's an implicit solver by design. So it has some quite robust nonlinear and linear solver. I guess the nice thing about it is uh, the capacity for dynamic mesh adaptation using a forest of arc tree approach or forest of tree approach. And this is, this comes through the deal two framework. So we'll see, uh, Lite is really built as a deal two solver. The core FEM engine behind is deal two. And it also has capacities for discrete element method for particle simulation. So a quick overview. So we work in my group on four things principally. So the first thing is computational fluid dynamics in complex chemical engineering processes. So what you see here is an animation or let's say a, a movie of the mixing at relatively low, low Reynolds number. I think this one is at a, a Reynolds number of uh, 5K. So uh, in a, an agitated vessel. So this is a kind of industrial processes or chemical engineering processes that we try to simulate on a, let's say routine basis. Uh, another thing we work a lot on are uh, granular flow. So the flow of particles or granular matter. These are omnipresent in the chemical engineering industry. So 75% or I think 70% of the material handled throughout uh, chemical processes contain particles at one point or another. So we develop a Lagrangian based model for the simulation of granular flow. So this is an example. So actually this is a quite a nice model and we've been able to scale it up, up until I think something like hundred million particles, which is not the best there is, but it's actually quite nice. Then the next point is clearly the combination of the two. So we try to look at uh, chemical processes where the interaction between the fluid and the particle plays a large role. We investigate these processes at the scale of the particle, a bit like what Luca, well, exactly what Luca showed uh, today. So we have a capacity for directly resolved numerical simulation around individual particles, but a few of them, like 10, 20, or 30 not like a hundred thousand or a uh, thousand. Uh, For simulations in which we have more particles, we have unresolved CFDDM capabilities. So in this case, we solve the fluid at a much coarser scale than the particles. And then we couple the average Navier-Stokes equation with the discrete element method. So with these type of, let's say with these four core axes, we're able to assess predict, design, and optimize the chemical engineering processes that we face. So it's really a, let's say, a numerical modeling strategy or numerical modeling approach to try and improve the design of chemical engineering operation. And in our case, we really focus on these dispersed uh, solid fluid flows, but also on single phase flows. So uh, let's move on from there. So some of the key points about the solver is that it, it uses an implicit stabilized continuous Galerkin formulation. So it supports for QN, QN element, but also QN, QN minus uh, one. So we, we allow for tensor elements, so quad Xs or simplex elements, so triangles and tetrahedron. So we use an implicit 
uh, solver. So we use Newton's method with an, an exact or an inexact Jacobian matrix. And everything we're going to be showing is going to be done with implicit time stepping. So either backward differencing scheme from order one to three or a single diagonal implicit Runge-Kutta scheme, uh, two stages or three stages. So the solver supports distributed parallelization through MPI. It supports about up to a, a billion degree of freedom. And it has uh, capabilities for dynamic mesh adaptation, as you've seen in the previous images. So uh, we didn't create everything from scratch. Okay, the core of it is actually uh, the Deal2 library. So this is a project I'm actively involved in the development of. So it's a distributed continuous Galerkin and discontinuous Galerkin finite element platform in one, two, and three D. And the thing is, we use a strategy of meta template programming for the dim dimension of the problem. So all of the solver that we designed in three D, they're also two D solvers. And the, I mean, if I count the number of lines that are different between the 2D and the 3D solver, I think it's something like 25. So the same code base is used for 2D DM, 3D DM, but also 2D CFD and 3D CFD and 2D coupled and 3D coupled. So that's a very nice thing about this is that we don't need to, uh, to work uh, this much to have a dimension independent code. But this is uh, when we had our last get together before COVID. So that was like two or three years ago, but through this uh, open source endeavor, I made some very, very good friends uh, from abroad the world. And it's been a very positive experience to work with this applied mathematics community and to move forward in our, let's say, more applied direction. So the key things we leverage are deal two, that's the FEM framework. Truly knows is what we use for linear algebra. And uh, we use P4S for the dynamic mesh adaptation on the forest of trees. So that's, let's say, the core, the core open source engines we have between behind it. So I won't spend too much time on this, but this is the SUPG, SSPG, stabilized and Stokes solver we use for. So we use a stabilized uh, continuity equation, and this actually relaxes the system a lot. And it really helps the linear solver to reach, let's say, better convergence. But still, this is not, uh, this is not maybe the optimal solution for for all of the cases we're going to be investigating, and you're going to see this in uh, what follows today. So uh, the first thing I did when I complete when we completed everything, or let's say the core of the solver, was to try and to validate it. Okay, so at the time I was chatting with a friend, and he was like, "Well, you know, you should start with the the DNS of uh, Taylor Green vertices. It's quite an easy test case to do, but it's going to show you know if you can actually achieve DNS if your numerical dissipation is too high and how your code is behaving." So this is an example of what we obtained at that time. At the left, you see the turbulent cascade in the vortices. This is nothing special. You know, a lot of codes have done these things. If you look at all of the large scale open source code, everybody pretty much has been through this uh, type of test case. At the right, you see the energy dissipation as measured through either the entropy uh, in green or through the temporal derivative of the kinetic energy. And what you hope is that if you achieve DNS, well, these two, they should match one another and they should match the reference result. The difference between the entropy energy dissipation and the kinetic energy dissipation in a way is going to be some form of numerical dissipation. So what we see is that, well, you know, in this case, we were able to get uh, quasi DNS results and to match very well the reference results, but also to have a very tiny minimal gap behind, between the uh, energy dissipation as measured through the integral of the entropy and the time derivative of the kinetic energy. So these first validation, you know, we were quite happy with these, but then I was like, okay, well, you know, what's next? So I chatted with the same friend. He was like, well, these uh, TGV cases, they're fun, right? But they're periodic and they're very idealized. And, you know, what you want to be looking at in your chemical engineering processes will contain walls. And these walls, they will have curvatures. And, you know, these are going to be more complex geometry. So this led me to the, the next, let's say, big curiosity and turbulence we wanted to look at, and that is uh, the, the flow over periodic hills. So let's go with this. So what is the flow over periodic hills? It's a very, very nice 3D flow test case that uh, has uh, been investigated both experimentally and numerically. So it's just the well-defined 3D flow pass over a series of hill in a periodic fashion. So now the thing you're going to tell me is, well, how, how can you have periodic in real life? You know, so in real life, the experiment they did in Germany was actually to design a set of 20 hills that were identical. 
And what they could do is that they would they measured, I think it was between the 13th and the 14th L and between the 14th and the 15th L. And at, between these two Ls, they could measure the average velocity, the renal stresses, and the reattachment length. And so they could say, okay, well, you know, between the 14th and the, uh, the 13th and the 14th and the 14th and the 15th, well, there was no difference. So clearly this case is, let's say, in a way established. So it's very cool because you can see that this experiment was designed for people like me in, in mind, you know, because this experiment is, it would be quasi impossible to simulate the 20 ills, you know, and have the bumps and everything. And then the inlet conditions would be quite difficult to, to get. But in this case, we can simulate this periodically. So the turbulence that's gonna be exiting at the right is gonna be fed back at the left. So actually we can mimic the experiments by doing a periodic simulation. So this is exactly what we want to validate. But what's very nice is we're gonna have well-defined experimental data. So it's just the flow from left to right over these tiny bumps, which are very well defined. They're perfectly smooth. So why are we going to look at this? Okay, so in this case, we're going to be looking at this at the Reynolds number of 5,600. And this case exhibits pretty much a lot of the complex phenomena we're going to be seeing in the chemical engineering industry, where we have curved wall or where we have detachment or reattachment process. So there, in this case, what you see at the right is the instantaneous velocity profile as we're moving toward it forward in time. So you see the cases as a lot of stuff. There's a pressure induced separation of the flow from a curved surface. There's an unsteady shear layer. You have a recirculation zone uh, in this region here at the, the bottom left. There's an attachment and a detachment of the boundary layers. There's recycling of the turbulence from the right to the left. So as we go and as we evolve, the turbulent flow is going to be recycled and we're going to reach some sort of statistically steady uh, flow. And there's a very nice mechanism that is difficult to see in the instant instantaneous simulation. But actually what happens is that eddies that are generated um, at the detached, uh, at, the, at the recirculation zone. So there's like some sort of Kelvin and Maltz instability between the, uh, the recirculation zone and the detached flow. And these eddies are going to be evicted from left to right and they're going to splat on the opposing ill. So you're going to have large eddies being transported. They're going to splat and they're going to spread out in the Z direction. So actually, you have a perfect example of a 3D complex turbulent flow. So there's a very, very, very nice experimental validation uh, article by RAP uh, produced in 2009. And there are multiple, multiple numerical investigations. I'm going to be comparing a lot to the RAP results, but also to the Brua results in 2009. These are what I would consider, I guess, the staple results on this case. But now people are still looking at this very recently. So in 2018 and 2020, and I saw papers published like a few months ago on this also. So it's a quite a an active uh, validation case, but I think it contains uh, a lot of stuff to assess if you know a CFD solver is behaving like we want it to behave. So what are going to be what are we going to be looking at today is we, we're going to try to establish the so everything we do in Lete is pretty much an implicit LES approach so we use we don't have an explicit turbulence model we don't have an explicit LES filter we let the stabilized FEM take care of what happens at the subgrid scale so what we're going to be trying to establish today is to see well what is the impact of the averaging time what is the impact of the time step and what is the impact of the mesh resolution on the three quantities of interest, that is, what is the average velocity profile? What are the renal stresses? And what are the what is the recirculation length? And you'll see that for these three things, we're going to get very interesting conclusions as to what is the impact of my simulation parameters in a way my hyperparameters or my numeric setups on these quantities. So I'm going to be showing a lot of graph like this, and I wanted to just have one so I can explain what it means. So in this graph, what you see is, so in the experiments, they measured the average velocity profile and the renal stresses at very specific location. Okay, so everything is non-dimensionalized by the height of the hill. So what you see here is that they measured, for example, the average, so the RAP results, for example, measured the average velocity at 0, 0 0.5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Okay, so we have the average velocity profile at eight locations. So now you might be wondering, well, why is it a, a line plot? So what they did is the, the average in the Z direction. So the velocity profile we're showing are the average in time. These are the statistically average flow, but they're also average in the depth of the domain. Okay, so it's a local quantity, yes or no, in the sense that there's some sort of averaging there. But still, these are going to be very interesting comparison to do. So we're going to show these 
uh, type of graph, not only for the velocity profile, but also for the Reynolds stresses. So let's go. So how is the simulation set up? It's a 3D simulation. We use periodic boundary condition in X and Z. So the flow exits from the left and will be recirculated at the left. So left to right comes back at left. And in the Z direction, it's also periodic. So we took, uh, Using the reference results of Brua, we decided on the depth of the channel in such a way that it was statistically not significant. So we had enough depth of the channel to have sufficient formation of the eddies and that it was not impeding or you did not have coupling or strong coupling in the Z direction. So the, there is no slip boundary condition at both the top and on the hill at the bottom. And the flow is going to be driven by momentum source term. So we drive a some sort of gravity term to move the flow forward from left to right and to compensate the resistance of the flow and the friction at the bottom. So we're going to be looking at the case at the Reynolds number of 5,600. But actually, um, in the literature, there's also results at 10K. So these are also very interesting. But today, I'm just going to be focusing on this. But this is... a uh, so what we're trying to get at is, is, is to look at these results and see, okay, well, uh, what type of results are we going to be obtaining here? So we're going to be comparing to the experiments of RAP, and we're going to be comparing to the simulation of Brewer. So the difference in the simulation of Brewer is that they, add, uh, they use an explicit LES model with the finite volume code. I think it was a vertex-centered finite volume formulation, and their results were obtained with uh, 12 million cells. So they, they didn't do any... Uh, parametric study or sensitivity study. They just took one mesh, 12 million cell, one time step, and they ran the simulation. And that's their reference results. They compared that to the, to the validation results. And that was, that was, they actually got a very, very good agreement. So that's interesting. So let's go on and let's first look at what I'm going to call the baseline results. So the first investigation of the case we did, what did we get out of it? And then uh, we're going to move on to the more specific things. So baseline, so in this graph, at the top left, you have the variable that I'm investigating. So in this case, is the average velocity profile in the x direction. And here you see the comparison between the experimental result in green, the Brewer results obtained with the LISOC code in 2009 in orange, and the Lette results with the baseline configuration uh, in uh, dark red, I would say. So as you see, it's kind of hard to see the differences. So I put these zooms with LoRa uh to see like okay well where are things different okay so close to the wall everything appears to agree quite well but we see maybe some slight differences between the experiments and the simulation but not that bad i guess here in this at the close to the reattachment length we see us like a small difference i guess we're at the right of the experiments the Brewer results are at the left i mean is there a slight disagreement not a slight disagreement it's just different like it's slightly different and finally we have this here uh, at the top, because there is also a circulation zone that tends to form at the top, and we, we see this uh, also a small difference here. So it's interesting, but at least these were the first simulations we launched with uh, mesh. We didn't think too much about anything, and I was quite happy because I was like, okay, well, you know, no parameters, no fitting, no nothing, and well, actually, it's uh, you know, game on. You know, it's it's actually working quite well. So when things uh, become a bit more complex is when you look at the Reynolds stresses. So one thing uh, I found very interesting is that the, the Reynolds stresses are much more different between the, Rain, the LESOC results and the experiment. And that's OK. I think experimentally measuring these Reynolds stresses must have been quite difficult. And I, I, I know the, they did an amazing job with this article. So I mean, these, these, there were experimental difficulties for sure. So we see that clearly at the, let's say, the up, upside of the ill before we fall in the, uh, before we have the beginning of the recirculation zone, there is a significant difference in the renal stresses. Uh, both, well, I guess, you know, everybody disagrees slightly, but the trends are similar. Uh, where things are a bit weirder, I guess, is in this region, which is the recirculating region. Here, uh, at uh, x over h equal 1 and x over h equal 2, where actually it seems that our implicit LES approach at you know, 0.5, 1, and 2 actually seems to fit more with the experimental data than with the other simulation. So for this, I'm not sure, you know, are the experiments fully right or I don't know, but this is something that we were trying to understand. You know, when we get these results with the first mesh, okay, it's very interesting, but then how are they going to change if we change the time step or if we change the mesh? So are these results like quasi-converged from a numerical point of view or not? And this is what we're going to be trying to understand in what follows. So what are some of the cases we investigated? So what I showed are the, showed are the baseline results. So we looked at the impact of the time step. So we use a second order BDF 
scheme in time. And we're going to be looking at very coarse value, 0 0.5, 0 0.1, and lower value, so 0 0.025 and 0 0.125. Okay, so what we can do when we go, like I said, when we leverage really the implicit character or when we go at CFL lower than one. We're going to also, let's say, try to measure what is the impact of the time averaging period on the quality of the results. So we're going to time average over 500 seconds to 1,100 uh, 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 seconds. So this means more than, more than 70 flow through. So these are very, very long simulations, not because, uh, not because only of like the mesh resolution, but because of how many time steps we're going to be doing. Okay, So for this simulation with 0 0.0125, it means we're going to be doing something like close to 50,000 to 100,000 iteration of this implicit method. So we're going to see some conclusions regarding this. We're also going to look at the impact of the mesh resolution with an intermediate mesh and a fine mesh with up to 8 million cells. And I'm not going to be talking too much about this, but we also looked at the impact of I order elements, so Q2, Q2, and also Q2, Q2. So let's move on. Let's first look at the effect of time step. Okay, so in our case, Lite is an implicit solver, so we can use any time step we want, and we should expect to remain uh, stable and everything. So first thing, we look at the impact of the time step on the average velocity. We see actually that the blue is the very coarse, blue is a very coarse time step. Green is let's say finer, and then we go finer and finer. Okay, so uh, what we clearly see here is that actually. Uh, at, in some regions, the, 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 the results become very quickly time step independent. We see it here, for example, at the top. We see it here at the top right. But actually, if you look at the bottom left, well, the results, they do, you know, they do, well, try to tend towards a bit like what, what Lessock obtained. But there is a significant variation of the results for the time step. So clearly, there is something at play here and uh, some of the regions. So here, this is at x over h equal 4. And in some of the other locations, this impact is a lot more magnified. So for example, at the bottom right, at x over h equals x, well, if you move from 0.1 to 0.05, you get some significant changes. 0.05 to 0.025, you still get changes. And then at that point, all the information collapses and the results are convergent. So for the renal stresses, it's uh, the Reynolds normal stresses, it's even more uh, predominant. Okay, so we see, for example, coarser time steps are significantly different, but then if you refine the time step or you lower it, all the results collapse on a single value. It's the same at the bottom left here, and it's the same here. At the top right, you actually see it, see it even clearly. Okay, so it means that if we use a two coarse time step and we try to leverage our implicit time stepping, well, we'll lose so much in time, temporal information and we lose so much temporal accuracy, then in the end, we're polluting our results. So um, <laughs> what do I draw as a conclusion here? So this is what we're gonna be looking at as we go on. So shear stresses are another good example. Here, the, sh the turbulent shear stresses, so you the average of U, U prime X, U prime Y, uh, they're extremely time step dependent, okay? And we see it here at the top right and we see it at, uh, here at the bottom left. So for some of the places we got very good time converge results, but if you look here, for example, uh, it really takes the finer time step to get results that are, you know, slightly less time step dependent. And what's very, very interesting about this is this is only at this finer time step that we collapse on the least stock result. So initially, you know, when I was looking at these results, especially at, at the top right, I was like, well, you know, we agree better with the experimental results. That's good. And I was like, oh, well, as we refine the time step, we change and we get an in between between the other simulation and the validation results. So. A very good metric for that is to look at the reattachment point. Okay, so it's discussed in the literature, but if you have a 1% error in the reattachment, the detachment point, you actually get a very significant difference in the reattachment point. So if you have 1% error on the detachment point, I think some authors uh, reported a, an error of 7% on the reattachment point. So detachment and reattachment, in this case, they're extremely sensitive. So here at the right, we have the, uh, the uh, convergence in time of the average reattachment uh, uh, length, let's say in this case, uh, at the time step of 0 0.025. And we see that actually the black results are the one measured experimentally by RAP. The least suck results are right here, that what they obtained after 150 flow through. And actually you see that they, they didn't match quite well. And uh, previous studies are other results obtained in the literature. So actually what we see is that as we increase the number of flow through, we're getting a quite a good uh, agreement with the experiments and we're converging in time 
uh, towards the same reattachment length that was obtained experimentally. What is crazy here is that time step has a very large impact on the reattachment point. Okay, so as we decrease the time step, we we converge really to a value which is exactly what was obtained experimentally. But what is traumatizing for me is this part here. Okay, so my statement is going to be, well, what's the point of using an implicit time stepping scheme if I need to go at a CFL of 0.4 to get time accurate results? And I don't have an answer to this. Okay, I just made a mistake, I guess, or just I just started on this premise that using high order implicit time stepping would be the best for this. And then, well, no, because I need such a fine time step to get good results. Well, you know, it's it's a challenge. Okay, and that's that's something we have to face. So first conclusion about time stepping is we need a really, really fine time step to get time independent, time step independent results. And okay, well, what's the point of being implicit at a CFL of 0.4? There's, I don't think there's any point, but I'm gonna live with that. It's my flaw, that's my mistake, and that's okay. You know, this is things you learn, and that's why we do these cases. So next, effective averaging time. This is a bit more simple. Uh, actually, what we should what we see is that if you go above five or six hundred seconds of averaging the results, they become independent of the averaging time. So the average velocity becomes independent of the averaging time and the rain, the, uh, sorry, that's the renal stresses. The renal stresses, they also become independent of the averaging time. So that's good. We're very happy with this. It means that if we average over a, a thousand seconds, it doesn't matter if we average over a thousand seconds or a hundred, a thousand, a hundred or a thousand and two hundred or whatever, these results, they don't change. So Average velocity they converge quite quickly. It took a bit more time, take a bit more time to converge for the renal stresses and the reattachment length. So the simulations they take a while because of the large number of flow through we are, that is required. Okay, we need to simulate up until a hundred flow through. So that's very very long simulation. You know, every fluid parcel would need to travel a hundred times to the geometry so that our results are fully time converged. But it's very interesting to see that we're able to be independent of the length of the simulation. Next thing, the effect of the mesh resolution. And this is actually the first thing I was really interested in looking at. So these implicit LES results, are they very mesh dependent? You know, if I change my mesh, will my results change significantly? So here we look at the average velocity and we have four meshes. In blue is 1 million, in green is 4 million, in red is 8 million cells. Okay, but they use the same topology. And actually what we see is that, okay, it, there are some slight, you know, changes. They're, they're very tiny, but they are there, okay? And they actually tend to bring us towards a bit more the least sock results, especially in the upper recirculating region than anything else. For the renal stresses, it's also very interesting, but it's, it's quite similar, actually. We didn't see any uh, mesh, let's say, dependence or strong mesh dependence. And what it means is that in this region, for example, where we were getting better agreement uh, with, the, with the experimental results than the least sock results, well, it's true, okay? This is exactly what we're getting. As we're refining the mesh, we're getting different results and it's all concentrated in this region, okay? So in this region with uh, X over H equal one, X over H equal two, or X over H equal 0.5, the detachment and the reattachment, this is the only place where our results are significantly different. So if we look at the impact of the mesh on the reattachment length, so here we have the results with 1 million cells that are baseline results. And here we have the same results, but with our 4 million cell. And we see that refining the time step, refining the mesh size, only like allows us to converge more quickly in terms of flow through to the same reattachment length. Okay, so we're getting the same results at, as was obtained experimentally. And you know, the other results are a bit more spread out from the previous studies or the Brewer results. It's a very sensitive data. Are the experiment true? Well, you know what, when you do numerics, you hope that the validation experiments are true, but I don't know what is the uncertainty on this measurement. Okay, so maybe we're very happy to compare to it positively, but maybe actually the real experimental uncertainty was like 0.1, so maybe not. I don't know, but it's very good to see that as we're refining the mesh, we're getting the same reattachment lengths. So in a way, it means that on the coarser cells, on using coarser cells, we were getting quite good predictions of the detachment and reattachment mechanism. So that's good. So... Actually, it's nice. I think that's going to leave a good, uh, you know, 10 minutes for, for a question. So this allows me to reach my conclusion. Okay. And some is good, some is bad, or some is just like a deception. Okay. Because I often go around and saying, you know, we use implicit methods. These are very good. But the first thing that I should note from this is this case. Okay. It requires a lot, a lot 
a lot of temporal accuracy, a lot more than I expected and we expected. So even with a second order BDF scheme, we need a very low CFL to get time step independent results. So we use an implicit scheme, but we use it below the stability threshold that we need. So what's the point? I don't know. That's a good reflection to keep on having, and we're gonna keep on exploring this. Maybe we need to, we have support for third order and fourth order time stepping scheme. So maybe with these, we could increase the time step a bit more and then leverage a bit the implicit character. Maybe not, okay, but that's a good question. Getting converged turbulence statistics is difficult. It's time consuming, okay? We required more than 70 flow through. So that means simulation with over 20K time steps to get uh, statistics and validation results which are independent of the number of flow through. So overall, though, uh, we got a very good agreement with both the RAP experimental results and the Bruer simulation results. And one thing I really wondered is this one. Okay, so why do we get such good predictions of the reattachment length, especially at very coarse grids? Okay, one million cell, we got much better prediction, uh, well, much better agreement with the experimental results than the Bruer results that use twelve million cells. And then I, I wonder. Okay, so I, one hypothesis I have for this, I guess, is that uh, we use a finite element approach, so we don't have any pressure boundary condition on the bottom and the top wall, right? So we don't have the zero pressure gradient boundary condition on the pressure field. And I'm really wondering if that could not play a role. I'm not sure, but I've seen some literature that discuss this element. So maybe it's just the way we impose the boundary condition, which is, which is different. But I was very happy about this because for chemical engineering processes, these are quite important. And so we get good prediction on this. And the good part is that this worked from the get-go. So the baseline results I showed you, I think this is like this first or the second simulation that Audrey ran and it worked straight up. So I was very happy because we don't have any turbulence model. We don't have any filter. We don't have any, there's no parameter here. So uh, I guess the conclusion that we got very good results with the relatively coarse meshes, but uh, I was not expecting the 1 million cell mesh to perform that well, but actually I was wrong to expect this, okay? Because some authors have recently reported very, very good results, which which mesh with meshes that were so coarse, I mean, 70,000 degrees of freedom, so 70,000 uh, 70, degrees of freedom. So we're talking about meshes which are 10 or 20 times coarser than the coarser mesh we use. And with these, they got actually very good agreement with the experimental results. So I'm, I'm, that's something we're gonna need to look into. Like, okay, so it worked at 1 million, but like how coarse can I go before things start to go bad? And that's actually very interesting. I was not expecting this initially. So we also wanna look into a uh, higher Reynolds number. And, and one thing that Laura is working on is to uh, look at this through a variational multi-scale approach perspective instead of just using a SUPG, SSPG stabilization approach. So uh, right now what we have is very rough. What Laura is working on is to make this a lot better in terms of subgrid closure. So uh, there's a lot of work coming up, but you know, in our case, this is very interesting because we're trying to look at turbulent, like early turbulent uh, chemical engineering processes where the Reynolds number is 1,000, 5,000, 10,000. So if we're able to predict quite well the like the transient flow and the statistics of, of uh, these chemical engineering processes at these Reynolds number, then it means that we can use our model without any type of tuning parameters for these. And this, this is very good for us because this is where we're trying to predict the yield and the and the dynamics of chemical reactions, for example, or the mixing there. So I'll conclude there. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizing committee for the invitation. And uh, I'd like to congratulate, especially the graduate students that presented at 10, uh, 10 a.m. and the postdoctoral fellows. I really liked the presentation. We're very, very good. So congrats. I think you have a bright future, all of you ahead. Uh, so I was uh, very pleased. And also, uh, I think the conference was very well organized. So I think a lot, uh, the organizer for this. So I'd like just to conclude, okay, I don't want to be the guy taking over credit for my students' work. So the core of the work was really done by Laura, Catherine, and Audrey. Uh, they deserve the congrats and they deserve the thanks. I think they did an amazing job. Uh, Catherine and Audrey, they did this uh, work only in a 12 or 14 weeks internship. So uh, I was uh, very happy that, you know, they could learn HPC and they could do all these things. So I, I'm super glad. And I think we have a bright generation of future uh, CFD practitioner uh, coming up. So I think that's it for me. And I uh, also would like to thank Compute Canada, the SBS uh, GPS, and uh, Polytechnic Montreal.